In this section, we'll discuss antihyperlipidemic medications, and we'll also go over a couple of cardiovascular vignettes that you may see on USMLE. In this section, we'll discuss antihyperlipidemic medications and go over some cardiovascular vignettes. It's very important for us to control our patient's cholesterol levels. Elevated plasma lipids can cause atherosclerosis, coronary disease, as well as peripheral vascular disease. This diagram shows a general progression in worsening atherosclerosis from age 10 through age 70. And what you can see is there's a higher risk for developing myocardial infarct, cerebral infarct, gangrene, and abdominal aortic aneurysm in patients that have developed complicated plaques, especially around age 40. Here we see a gross pathology image of an aorta that's been sliced open, and you can see how bad this patient has atherosclerosis in the aorta, and you can see the complicated plaque here in the aorta associated with thrombosis. In this patient, you can see that because of atheroembolism, which means fatty plaques that have been thrown off into the arteries, this patient actually has digital necrosis in multiple toes because of fatty plaques that have sprung off the artery and lodged themselves into the small arteries in the foot. Patients that have hyperlipidemia, you can often see the effects of this in their bodies. You can see retinal lipid deposits. You can see periorbital lipid deposits, as well as skin lesions called xanthomas. You can see tendon xanthomas in the Achilles tendon. Patients that have high cholesterol are also more likely to develop cholesterol gallstones, as you can see in this gross pathology image. And as you know, unfavorable lipid profiles include a decreased HDL of less than 55, elevated LDL greater than 100 in most cases, elevated VLDL, and elevated triglycerides. There are many different classes of antihyperlipidemics. The ones we'll talk about today are bile, bile acid sequestrants, statins or HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, nicotinic acid, and fibrates. The bile acid sequestrants include two major drugs that are given today. Those are cholytyramine and cholestopol. These are bile acid resins that are able to complex or bind to bile salts. This complex present, prevents the reabsorption of the bile salts from the GI tract. As you know, bile salts are actually made from cholesterol. If our bodies are able to get rid of these bile salts, then we will have to generate more bile salts through endogenous cholesterol. This works to lower cholesterol levels. These medications are relatively safe. However, they have many annoying GI side effects, including bloating and constipation. They can also decrease the absorption of lipid-soluble drugs and vitamins. The most important medications that we see that help lower cholesterol are the statin medications. Some of the more common ones are seen here, lovastatin, simvastatin, and atorvastatin. These medications work by inhibiting the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, which is the rate-limiting step in cholesterol synthesis in the human. These work by decreasing plasma LDL and VLDL. 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutyryl-CoA is converted to mevalonate by HMG-CoA reductase. Statins work by blocking this enzyme. Mevalonate is not only used to form cholesterol, but it's also used to form pharnacyl geronyl geronyl groups, which are used as linkers for proteins to the cell membrane. Scientists have postulated that statins have anti-inflammatory properties because they're able to prevent this step as well. Certain inflammatory proteins rely on this prenylation in order to do their job. As you can see from this slide, in the y-axis we have increasing cholesterol over dose of statin. And you can see that as the dose of the statin increases, you can see that the cholesterol level goes down, especially when statins are given along with a bile acid binding resin. Over time as well, HDL will slightly rise. Both of these are very good for preventing atherosclerosis. Statins do have some adverse effects. Overall, they have a very excellent safety record. There are some concerns about liver damage, therefore patients should have liver function tests drawn regularly. 
Some infrequent side effects of statins include increased LFTs or increased liver function tests, myopathy, and rhabdomyolysis. This risk is increased when patients are given gemfibrozil and nicotinic acid along with the statin. Another medication that's commonly given for elevated cholesterol is niacin or nicotinic, nicotinic acid. Nicotinic acid at low doses is a vitamin, but in large doses, two to six grams per day, it's been shown to raise HDL and lower VLDL as well as LDL and triglycerides. The problem with this medication is it's a very difficult drug to take. Most patients who take this medication develop some side effect, and that can include flushing and pruritus associated with the upper body and face. And this is because nicotinic acid causes the production of prostaglandin D2. Patients that develop these side effects can sometimes take aspirin, which can help prevent these side effects. Another class of medications commonly given for elevated cholesterol are the fibrates, gemfibrozil and clofibrate. These medications activate lipoprotein lipase, which causes catabolism or breakdown of VLDL. Overall, this causes lower VLDL triglycerides and LDL. These medications can also cause small increases in HDL. Generally, these medications are very well tolerated. Sometimes they can cause myositis and hypokalemia. Let's do some cardiac physiology cases. For the first case, we have a 58-year-old man who comes in to see his cardiologist because of an increased need for nitroglycerin patches in order to control his oppressive exercise-induced chest pain, or angina. For history of present illness, we have a patient who in the past was using one patch of nitroglycerin five minutes before physical activity, and this would control his symptoms. Now he has to take two tablets. Vital signs show a normal blood pressure, and on physical exam, that's unremarkable, an obese male in no acute distress. Some questions to ask yourself at this point. What is the technical term for a diminished response during a sustained administration of any drug? And what is the recommended, recommended management for this patient? So this patient has developed nitrate tachyphylaxis. And again, this is basically equivalent to tolerance. He's taking too much nitrate, and it's become ineffective for him. For this patient, the job of the physician is to adjust the timing of his nitrate medication in order every day to have an 8 to 12 hour period free of nitroglycerin. This will allow the body to reset itself. If the patient cannot do this, then we should consider adding another medication for his angina, perhaps a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker or some other coronary vasodilator. For cardiology case number two, we have a 45-year-old male who's complaining of fatigue, headache, dizziness, dry cough, shortness of breath, and constipation. This patient has been receiving treatment for chronic palpitations that arose spontaneously with tachycardia that would reach 220 beats per minute. And this increased whenever he would drink coffee under stress and smoke cigarettes. On physical exam, we see a patient that has bradycardia, heart rate 55, blood pressure normal, no fever. Physical exam, he's conscious and oriented, no neck masses, diffuse crackles, though, and wheezes in both lung fields, predominantly in the bases. His abdominal exam is normal. His neurologic exam is normal. He does, however, have violaceous skin discoloration in sun-exposed areas. Here's a representative picture of what this patient's skin looks like on the earlobe. On labs, we see a prolonged QT interval and QRS duration. On imaging, we see bilateral interstitial pulmonary infiltrates. What drug is this patient most likely taking? How is this drug classified? What adverse effect is the most concerning here and should prompt withdrawal of the drug? And what endocrine effects can this drug have? So this patient is taking amiodarone for his arrhythmia. This is a class three antiarrhythmic. Again, it's a, calcium, a potassium channel blocker. Sorry. It's very effective for a wide range of atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, and it has a very long half-life of 30 to 60 days. It also decreases clearance of many medications. As we talked about before, blue-gray skin pigmentation, which this patient has. He also has lung sounds and a chest x-ray that's worrisome, so he may have developed pulmonary fibrosis. These patients can also develop the following side effects as well. The treatment for this patient is to monitor his ECG and vital signs. We should also regulate his thyroid function pharmacology, phar phar pharmacologically by checking uh, TSH levels. And if this patient is 
exhibiting pulmonary fibrosis, we should discontinue the amiodarone. This is the end of the cardiovascular section. In the next section, we'll discuss medications for asthma and COPD.